As Latter-day Saint leaders, we face very difficult conversations that put us at risk of saying the wrong thing that can do more harm than good. Many of these conversations relate to LGBTQ Latter-day Saints. Have you had a fellow board member come out to you about their LGBT identity? Have you had LGBT neighbors and you just don't know what to say to them, so you ignore them instead? Have you wrestled with balancing love for your fellow men while still respecting the doctrines of the restored gospel? In order to help, Leading Saints has put together the LGBT Saints Library with more than 20 presentations featuring individuals who have a unique perspective or expertise around this topic. Three of the most popular sessions are available now to watch. Simply text the word LEAD to 474747 to start watching now or visit leadingsaints.org slash LGBT. The following episode is a throwback episode, one that was published previously and was extremely popular. To see the details of when this was originally published, see the show notes. Enjoy this throwback episode. Leading Saints is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. And we do that through various ways, including this very podcast that you're listening to. I hope you subscribe. Maybe leave us a review while you're at it. And I think you'll enjoy the content you find on this podcast. And then jump on over to leadingsaints.org and you'll find thousands of articles dedicated to leadership context as it relates to uh, being a Latter-day Saint. Uh, we have virtual summits that we've done. Check us out on social media and also a, a weekly newsletter that goes out that has unique content you won't find anywhere else. So a jump into the Leading Saints world. We're glad to have you. Today, I am in a beautiful immigration canyon with my good friends, Bennett and Becky Borden. How are you two? Doing great. Thanks. Doing Heard great. well. Well, and I f- first met you two at the North Star Conference back in, uh, what was that, March? March. Of 2017. And you were there. You were one of the keynotes to talk about your experience. And nonetheless, let's just get you two in context. And uh, Bennett, we'll start with you. What, how would you describe your upbringing, where you're from, and uh, maybe what landed you on a mission? Sure. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. So I'm from a small town in Tennessee outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, and so was born and raised there to first generation converts and have five older brothers and no sisters. So you can imagine what that was like growing up and growing up in the kind of the rural South uh, where the church wasn't very big and strong. So we knew everybody in our little branch uh, that eventually became a ward, but also it was challenging growing up in the South because I had um, always kind of known since I was a little kid that I was gay. and you know, came out of a difficult kind of growing up period because of that. And in fact, when it, when that became more of an issue in my life, it caused kind of the separation of me and my family when I was a young teenager. And so spent a lot of my life alone as a younger kid, but eventually kind of reconciled that with my family and, and went on a mission. I was a sign language missionary, which is kind of a cool mission because you get to, uh, instead of going called to a mission, you're called uh, every time you transfer, you transfer from mission to mission, which was nice. And so I spent uh, the first eight months in Indiana. And then the second eight months I was in North Carolina, which is where I actually met Becky's family, which is a big part of this story because her stepfather was our ward mission leader. And so I spent a great deal of time yeah, with bet. their family. And then I finished my mission in, in Michigan. But throughout that period, you know, the same sex attraction was really part of my life ever since I was a, a small child. And so that really became a predominant issue in my life. But that took me through my mission anyway. And Becky, what about you? What's, uh, what's your, what was your upbringing like? So I was also born and raised in the South to a first generation convert parents. And I am the oldest of five kids from my mother. And Grew up a member of the church and, you know, I, I did all the things 
that I was supposed to do and was president of all my little groups and president and little seminary <laughs> president and Laurel president. You know, I did yeah, all the yeah. things. I was M- M- Molly Mormon. Um, but I knew from the age of probably 10 or 11 that I was attracted to girls. And I, you know, it, I, you know, some people maybe have heard me say this before, but it, you know, when I knew that I liked girls more than other girls liked girls, I thought, yay. I thought, you know, I'm, <laughs> yay, I'm special. Yeah. Um, it didn't occur to me that there was something wrong with me. I just thought, hey, I've got something. I, not only do I appreciate boys, but I really like girls too. So yay me. Interesting. So I, I, I kind of went with that. I dated boys through high school. I, I was never, I never dated any girls in high school, but you know, I, I got married, gosh, by the time I was 21 to a boy and, uh, it did, was not uh, the best decision I ever made. And, uh, I ended up leaving the church during that time and was excommunicated and which was a huge blessing in retrospect. I didn't think so at the time, but it was in retrospect. And so then it brings me to about the age of where we just left off with Bennett's story. So, but yeah, I met Bennett when I was 14. He was a missionary in our ward and we had almost 20 sisters and elders assigned to our ward um, wow. because it was rural North Carolina. Yeah. So there was lots of work to do. And, you know, our, the, the mission he was in was half of the state. So we, when we had correlation and dessert on Saturday nights at our house, it was all afternoon and evening because there were so many sisters and elders. Yeah. So we, you know, the fun thing was because my mom was also a stake missionary at the time, whenever, you know, Bennett and his companion or anybody needed to go anywhere, if they didn't have a car, you know, my mom took them wherever they needed to go. And so we spent a lot of time <laughs> with him. We got to know Bennett really well in that eight months. And he just kind of became part of our family, I think, at that point. It was wonderful. And we've stayed friends since that time for the last 25 years, 28, 28 years now. Yeah. Something ridiculous. Yeah. Yes. Something <laughs> ridiculous. And so after your mission, uh, Bennett, I mean, there was still that connection with Becky's family, just uh, you Christmas cards, maybe go visit type thing or? Yeah, quite a lot. So the, her family really became my family. So, you know, her little brothers and sisters became just like my family. We were very, very close and for really the next 25 years. Mm-hmm. And he was at people's weddings and school plays and family yeah. where he came to family reunions. I mean, he was just part of our group. He was like the big brother. It was very close to that family, which has been one of the great blessings of my life. But soon after my mission, I went to BYU right after I got off my mission. And after a couple of semesters, I actually got married to a sister missionary who I was on my mission with. And it was interesting because um, she knew my background. And your your background of experiencing same-sex attraction. Yeah. Uh-huh. And kind of what I'd gone through as a kid and and all of that. And she really wanted to marry me. And I thought, well, that's unusual, right? This is going to be the only chance I have, right, of ever having a marriage. And so we got married in a temple wedding. And, but within a couple of years, we got divorced, which was hard on everybody. But in the, looking back on it, it's, it's a good thing. But that was really challenging for me after I had gone on my mission and done, you know, I had a temple marriage and all these things. And yet, same sex attraction was still a huge part of my existence. And, you know, when my first marriage fell apart, I wasn't terribly thrilled with things. Um, oh, and, God. Yeah, oh, I God. was pretty mad at, at God at that point. Uh, and it was one of those things where you felt like you were doing everything you were supposed to do, right? You went on a mission, you came home, found a girl to marry, and, and that didn't work. Yeah, exactly. Followed all the formula you're supposed to. You know, we were Sunday school teachers and, and the elders corn presidencies and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, Looking back on it now, I really understand much more about my journey. But at the time, I felt like... Betrayed almost. Yeah. yeah. Like this been handed a really raw deal. And why why fight this anymore? Why? Yeah. You know, and so I came out kind of at that point and really was out for the next 20 years uh, living an openly gay lifestyle. And when you say you came out, uh, your family was aware of that you were gay, but you were just coming out as the full lifestyle and everything. Yeah, because I had, you know, when I went on my mission and then got married, of course, everyone was thrilled with that, right? Because yeah. that's, oh, oh, good. He's fixed. He's good. You know, <laughs> everything's going to be great. We, got, we um, fixed him. Right. Right. <laughs> we prayed it. We prayed hard enough. Yeah. And so really when I, when my marriage fell apart, I stopped going to church and I stopped trying to stop being gay. And so, you know, I went out and I was, you know, very much in the gay community to the point where within... I don't know, a couple of months of my marriage falling apart. I actually met a man who I eventually married and it was with for the next 20 years. That's great. And Becky, what about your your journey? I mean, at this point, you're still 
I mean, you still know of of Bennett and and what was your where were you at when you heard of you know of Bennett's relationship falling apart and he's sort of headed down a different path? Well, I remember hearing that Bennett. I was in his wedding when he uh, married the sister missionary. I was a bridesmaid. So I knew them both well. Um, There's so much irony. I know in, there is so story. much irony. So, you really can't make this up. It only gets worse yeah. so, or, or more. I would say worse, but exactly. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. So yeah, I was in the wedding, and I knew them both and loved them both very much. And I was sad that they divorced, but I, you know, it was clear that they weren't happy. So yeah. you know, that's way more important, I think. And I was going through my own stuff at the time, and you know, graduated from high school, and you know, going to college, and then married this boy who turned out to be not, not be the nicest person to me at the time. And so that was difficult. And I knew during that time that I was interested in women. And when my marriage ended after two years, it wasn't, didn't last very long. And I came out immediately because I knew I was like, I'm done with this. And, and I know who I am now. And yeah, I think I called my mom and said, sit down <laughs> and uh, told her, Hey, I'm, I'm gay and I'm divorcing Brian. And uh, so that was, you know, she dealt with it remarkably well. And I think you mentioned uh, at North Star, your family wasn't a fan of Brian. <laughs> no, no, no. They were thrilled that that I think that that marriage was over. They were not a fan of Brian. Yeah, he had not ingratiated himself with my family. So, yeah, they were OK with that. And my mom said, you know, Heavenly Father told me that this was going to happen and that I needed to be prepared for it. So whatever it is, it's fine and we'll figure it out. Hmm. And I thought, well, that's not the response I expected. Yeah. So yeah, I was going to ask you, do you expected sort of a I, disappointed? I wasn't response? sure what to expect from her. I, I really didn't know, but I knew that I owed her the courtesy of telling her. Um, and I figured, you know, it's like ripping off a band aid. If I just went ahead and told her all yeah. the things at one time, it would be easier. Yeah. And so, you know, she knows me well. And she dealt with it pretty well. So when I came out at that point, I was in several short term relationships as I was trying to get my feet under me. I was 23 uh, when I came out and um, made some incredibly terrible decisions in relationships that were very difficult for me, very hard on me and learned a lot in a very short amount of time. I had to ramp up very quickly, but I loved the community. I loved being part of the gay community. I loved my identity. And it's interesting because having grown up LDS and being told you're unique and you're special and you're not like the rest, it was really no big stretch to be a lesbian and be unique and not like the rest. I'm like, peculiar people. Right. And I, and I was (laughs) like, okay, I can, I I know how that works. I'm okay with that. And so I, I had no problem with it. I really truly loved my life. I had some wonderful friendships and wonderful experiences in and amongst some difficult relationships. Yeah. So as both of you, uh, you know, went through this transition of coming out and and going down the path of, you know, living a gay lifestyle, how would you classify your faith? It sounds like with you, Bennett, you were were sort of angry with God at the moment, but I would imagine there was still something churning within you as far as faith and what you believed and and your relationship with the gospel. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, my anger at God actually worked to my benefit because, you know, when it says, you know, ask and you shall receive... That works if you're yelling at God too, right? If any kind of communication <laughs> with God. At least you're um, communicating. Right. right. And because the thing that I was so frustrated with is why this is so blatantly unfair. You know, I had a wonderful mission and had a, a very deep testimony. Absolutely knew the gospel would be true. And yet this seemed being born as someone who's gay and feeling the way that I did and yet not being able to act on any of those feelings to me just seemed like the most unfair, cruel thing that someone could do. And in that kind of dialogue that I had with God, it's interesting. I actually went on what I call a religious walkabout. And so I decided I was going to study really every religion I gave my hands on Eastern, Western, Wiccan. Like I studied like everything. (laughs) Native Um, American. Yeah. Native American earth religions, because I figured somewhere in there, man's attempt to understand God, that even if it's a poor reflection, there's, there's kernels of truth in there somewhere. And so it was very interesting as I learned all about these different perspectives on God and our role in the world, it all kept coming back to the gospel though, right? And in the midst of that, I realized that, and this is kind of what the gay community did for me too, and being in my relationship with my ex-husband, that I had value, that I wasn't a mistake. There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing, I wasn't a mistake, that, that God created me on purpose. And that that meant that part of the bundle of characteristics that make me gay 
are part of God's plan. And so I stopped rejecting myself and stopped being angry at myself and started to, to realize that I was a precious child of my father in heaven, regardless of what that meant. And so while I, I, so I finally came to the place was, okay, well, I know the gospel's true, but there's nothing I can do to live it. And so I'm just going to kind of go into this pause mode, I yeah. guess, for a while. Yeah, that's what, that's the impression I'm getting is that you just sort of set it on a shelf for a while and thought, maybe I'll come back to this. Maybe I went, won't, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm going this way because I don't know what else to do at this point, right? Yeah. Uh, was it similar for you, Becky? Yeah, I would say I end up, ended up in the same situation. I did a, a very similar religious walk about I, but I also tried to join a, I tried, joined a Lutheran church and then I joined a, <laughs> wow. like an MCC oh no, a UCC, um, United Church of Christ. And, uh, yep. I joined several different churches <laughs> and enjoyed the people and yeah. enjoyed what I learned there. I was looking so hard to recreate what I had in the LDS church, thinking that I could find it. If I found enough kernels of truth, I could put them all together and have a bowl of popcorn yeah. is really what I thought. But I, I learned that I d there was too many missing. I yeah. wasn't finding enough. And the, the religions and the places where I was attending, there wasn't enough God in it. God huh. had been taken out of it and I, I didn't find what I was looking for. But I realized that I wanted that and that was a surprise to me. But just like Bennett, I would say I had to put it in a jar and put it on the shelf under needs more information. Hmm. Because, you know, if the church was true, then something had to be different about my life in order for me to be a part of it. And I couldn't see my way clear to do that. I didn't I didn't know how that would look. And so I figured I just didn't know yet. And I'd figured out whether it was this life or the next. And I had no I had no expectation that it would be this one. Yeah. And, and you know, th thinking on that is. You know, with with hindsight, we know that things work out and whatever it is, and, and we'll get, move on to that part of the story. But I'm just thinking of sometimes, you know, from a leader's perspective, I remember many times an individual coming in with whether strong doubts or, you know, not necessarily experiencing same-sex attraction, but something in their life that they just can't understand how to put all the pieces together in the framing it with the gospel. And so, of course, as a bishop, as an you know, I, I would never say, well, well, maybe you should go on a religious walkabout, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> have you thought of this? You know, I, I, you know, but nonetheless, I would sometimes congratulate them that, wow, isn't it great that you're thinking about things differently than many of the members of the church are right now, right? And, but uh, without uh, encouraging them like on the religious walkabout. So what, uh, with hindsight, what can we learn from that as we see individuals that are maybe just, they can't figure it all out right now. And so really the strong momentum of their situation is taking them down the path of uh, away from the church a while. You know, that's such a great perspective because, you know, looking back now to where my life has gone, you know, my experience away from the church and especially being in my relationship with my ex-husband was vital to my salvation. Like, you know, I came from a, a really pretty abusive background and my husband did as well. And us being together, you know, that does stuff to you when you come from a, a situation like that as a child. And we understood each other. Like us being together actually was an incredibly healing experience. You know, so many people, when they get concerned about their loved one or a child or a friend who experience the same sex attraction has come out as in a relationship and they think there's some, this is a horrible thing, right? But I think we sometimes forget that every relationship, most relationships have goodness in them, right? Like when you're with somebody, you learn wonderful things about how to be caring and kind and learn and not to be selfish and how to put the toothpaste tube back on and, you know, things like that, that are the same with whether it's a gay or straight relationship. And so learning goodness and learning truth no matter where you're learning it is a gospel principle. And so there were tremendous things that I learned and healed from and gained over that experience. And so looking back now, I see how the Lord is with me all the time, like to help me learn the things that I needed to and to heal from things that I needed to heal from in order to allow me to approach the gospel in a more healthy and mature way later in my life. And this is interesting when you say, you know, that you're, your relationship with, with Richard was, was vital to your, sal to your salvation. And I don't necessarily thinking, you know, if you go back, it's like, well, this is the only option for me to progress, but you're finding, and you're not necessarily, you know, condoning that, you know, if I was to do it all over again, maybe I'd go that path or, but mainly you're just saying as individuals wander, we sometimes feel like progression has stopped. 
and it will not right. it will not pick up again until they come back. Right. And that's exactly it. And that's, you know, that's a fallacy that Satan tries to convince you of why you're away. Yeah. But, but I think he tries to convince our friends and families of that too. Mm. And because, our leaders. Yeah. 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 Because if we're somehow lost, it's as if n- nothing good happens while you're lost. And that's just not true. The light and love of God shines everywhere. And there were times in my relationship where I prayed very hard about it and absolutely knew absolutely knew that the right thing for me at that time was to be in that relationship, learning what I was doing. And so that's the thing I think we often forget is that we, no matter where you at in your life, God can reach where that place is and there can be goodness and learning and growth that can happen, even if they appear to be quote unquote lost. Yeah. And I would say it's interesting. I remember when I was 21, 20, and I had joined this Lutheran church and I really wasn't sure about the gospel anymore. I'd gotten a hold of a lot of anti-Mormon books and literature and the God makers and all kinds of stuff from this boy that I was dating. And I, you know, I had been pretty sheltered as far as that stuff goes. I'd never seen any of it before. Yeah. And it shook me enough where I thought, I don't know how I feel about the church. I don't know if I believe it or I don't believe it. I'm really on the fence. And because I'm not a fence sitter, I probably shouldn't be a member until I'm sure that I want to be a member. Yeah. And so, you know, I had a, my bishop came to visit me during that time and drove hours down to Eastern North Carolina where I was living to come talk to me and find out whether I was, you know, still living the gospel. And, you know, at the time, you know, when they asked me what I would say about the church to other people, if I were asked or, you know, what I was, what kind of religious life I was currently living. And I told them that I would join this Lutheran church and, and, you know, they decided after that interview that it was probably best for me not to be a member of the church at this time. And they excommunicated me. And I thought, well, how did he get that out of our conversation? Honestly, how did he even come away with that? And I'm so glad that he followed his inspiration at that time, because the journey that I needed to go on, it was better for me not to be under the covenants that I had made for me to do that. And that's an interesting thing to be, to have to say at this point, right? But I think that he was inspired to release me from those things so that I could go learn what I needed to learn so that when I came back, it would be a completely different experience. Yeah. And I'm really grateful for that. It's, I can't imagine how hard it must be for a leader to follow inspiration Mm. like that. And this is such an interesting concept because of course, you know, every leader, you know, if a bishop's sitting in his office with an individual, of course, he's going to encourage, you know, to, to turn towards the scriptures, to prayer, to do those things because, there's definitely progress in those things as well, but there, there's such a message of hope and grace when we're able as, and it's a strong leadership principle, step back and see somebody go off and wander from our perspective and know that, that Christ still has them and that he'll be constantly reaching out to them, constantly teaching them through their life experiences. And in a, you know, in, in the hyperbolic uh, church stories and things, it's like, well, no, like you're supposed to read your scriptures and then you come back and then through the ordinances, you progress. But just, just have faith in that the God never forgets them. And it's not your job to chase them sometimes. Maybe that drive is, is important so you can have those communications. But sometimes just let them go and always let them know they're welcome here. But know that Christ is still in their life and, and working with them. Yeah. And you can have incredible influence on people regardless of where they are. I think sometimes when we see someone who is quote unquote lost, they're out, you know, that we, we kind of close all our influence to them. Um, we don't have them over to our house. We don't go find out about their lives. We don't. And I find that that is exactly what the adversary wants. Right. It's the opposite of what we should be doing. You know, Becky and I say, you know, cause we're asked all the time because, you know, obviously now we're, you know, as the story will progress, we're back in the church and we're married to each other in a temple marriage. And, and that, you know, we had a lot of people who were of great influence to us while we were out of the church though. Mm-hmm. And the thing that, the, the thing that brought us back to the gospel is being around people who had the spirit with them yes. and then going back to our lives that didn't have the spirit with us. And many, so many times we see, we talk to parents or we talk to especially parents who kids are coming out and they, you know, they cut off contact with them or they throw them out of their lives. That's the opposite of what you should be doing. You know, being able to, you can't influence people you don't have access to. And so, you know, we the people who had the biggest influence on us, especially in our family, were those who stayed in touch with our lives. Yeah, um, and knew us, knew our partners' names, knew what they did for a living, knew if they were up for a promotion, knew when yeah. their birthdays were. You know, 
and you talk about that influence is so important and, and that influence through relationships where you lay the whole, you know, I'm gay thing on top of it as well. It becomes even more awkward. Like, well, how, you know, am I supposed to interact with their, their gay partner, their spouse? Am I, do we invite them over dinner? Should they be in our family pictures? Like we sort of get caught up in these details because there's just such this uh, culture about it that, yeah. that interferes that then it's just easier to keep our, our space. And I, you know, as Bishop, I, I think of a gay couple in my ward that we just sort of kept a mutual uh, space of saying, OK, you don't really want to talk to me. I don't really know what to say to you. So yeah. let's just not say anything. But then it really minimized my influence there. Or if I just move forward with a intent of a relationship, of a friendship and let it go from there, then it's not up to me to know to say the right thing. Right, right. So let's uh, pivot back. I, that's a good discussion. We'll, we'll touch on that as we go. But let's pivot back to your story, Bennett. Wh- where do we go from from there? With your, you're now in this gay relationship for 20 years. You get married. That you know your family's still in, in the church. So that influence of you know church stuff is still in your life from time to time. So what brought you back? You know, and it's interesting. A few years after Richard and I were together, I did find this peace and equilibrium with the gospel that I, I felt really close to God. I read my scriptures, but I really did, you know, as we talked about, kind of just put it on a shelf. What do I do? Especially because I really did feel like I was where I was supposed to be. But I missed the gospel, right? Especially having been in doubt, having gone on a mission like Becky, you know, going to other kind of churches, there wasn't the community, there wasn't the spirit there. And over time that weighed on me, you know, and I, I kept trying to pursue happiness. And so, you know, I went to law school, I became a big successful partner at a big law firm. You know, Richard and I were together. We were a very successful kind of power couple in DC. We had lots of friends. We had nice cars. We had, you know, I had all the things and kept thinking, if I just this or if I just that, then I'll be happy. But then I got all those things and I still wasn't happy. And so this was in my, you know, my early 40s at this point where I really took a look at my life and thought, if I died today, I would be disappointed with my life that regardless of all I had achieved and and where I was at in my life, I had this deep aching and longing for the gospel. And so interestingly, when we, um, when that started to come about, it was interesting because even in my relationship, it was kind of clear that it was coming to an end. And this was, I guess, what, five years ago or so. Your, your relationship was coming to with an Richard, end. With Richard, yeah. And it allowed me to kind of re-evaluate my life. And that's a really interesting point that, that, you know, what Becky, what was going on in Becky's in my life at that point. But throughout that period, when I was trying to put my life kind of back together and, and seek out the church, it was really interesting to see what the Lord had done in both Becky's and my life at that point. So Becky, where were you at uh, during this process? I'm sure during these 20 years, you, you communicated, you both knew you were living in, in oh, gay yeah. relationships. Oh and- yeah. And I, I knew Richard um, and I was at their wedding and, uh, <laughs> yeah, as not a bridesmaid, no, or a, not a, a bridesmaid a, this time. No, <laughs> just as family. Cause none of his other family was there. So one of my younger sisters and I went to represent his family, um, at his wedding in DC. And, um, at that, at that point I was in, I had been in many different relationships, some truly wonderful women that I love very dearly. Um, I even married one of them in just a, a civil ceremony. It wasn't uh-huh. illegal. It was before it was legal. And uh, Bennett was at that wedding and came to my wedding. Um, and so, we, you know, we just were learning and growing. It was a, just a time of of just learning and growing. And I remember there were many times that I'd have these incredibly lucid moments when I'd had way too much red wine and, <laughs> and I would go, the church is true. And I would call my mom <laughs> drunk. I would call my mom and, uh, and barrier testimony. And, and yeah, say, the church is true, mom. She goes, I know. <laughs> and uh, she's like, should we talk about this tomorrow? Can I call? I'm like, no. No, we can never talk about this again. <laughs> and to her credit, she never held it over me. But yeah. you know, I so it was interesting in, in adding up all those little moments over time where yeah. I where I would, you know, or on my birthday every year I would talk to God. That was my one conversation a year. Oh. Um and and I really adding up all those moments and conversations is like, yeah, yeah, there's something I'm missing. Um, but I am who I am. So I, I still don't know how that's gonna figure itself out. And I remember at the end of one of my relationships before my last one, uh, I had said, okay, 
God, if I'm really supposed to go back to the church, then there shouldn't stop putting women in front of me that I'm supposed to be with. Because just like Bennett, yeah. I had prayed over, you know, am I supposed to be in this r- relationship? Am I supposed to be with this person? And and I would get these, yeah, this is where you're supposed to be right now. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And you need to learn something from this person and they do from you. And so I, I said, okay, God, if I'm, if I'm going to have to come, if I'm going to be able to come back, you stop putting people in front of me. And and so after my last relationship was ending and I was devastated by it, it was a very long but wonderful relationship. And I, and I truly was, I loved this woman with all my heart and it was very hard for me, but I said, okay, maybe, maybe I need to consider other things. Um, and you know, that kind of brings us to five yeah. years ago. So <laughs> yeah, let me ask you during this, you know, 20 or so years, did was there ever a, a bishop, a elders quorum president that reached out or was bold enough to knock on your door or and it sounds like you didn't necessarily need that or want that, but or maybe you did. You know, with me, it was interesting. Most of the influence was, was with some of my family, especially one of my brothers, Bob, who is closest to me in age and closest to me. Um, and and he had an immense impact on me. The um there was a, a bishop who was tremendous. Um And this was when I was living in D.C. and Richard and I had been together for about five years, I guess. And um, I was particularly longing to kind of have an interaction with the church and kind of. And so I actually um, uh, attended a ward like I found a ward and went one Sunday and this bishop um, said hello, as he did, and and asked, you know, we got kind of got to know each other. Um, And 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 Becky's family, her mother lived in uh, the suburb of D.C., um, with some of Becky's siblings. Um, and it was their bishop, it turned out to be. Um, and he and I developed got a very close relationship over the next four or five months and really kind of talked about where I was at and what I wanted. And I I expressed to him this um, pain that I felt um, about wanting to be in the church, but really feeling like, one, my nature didn't make it possible, but also I, mean, I was in this really wonderful relationship. Yeah. Um, and that's actually when I... Um, went through the disciplinary process um, with this wonderfully loving bishop um, and uh, equally loving state president. And it was interesting at that point, they um, took me through the process and I was excommunicated. Um, And how how long into your relationship with Richard was this? uh, Like five or six years. Okay. So there's, you weren't even halfway through that. No, it was, and it turned out to be a truly loving experience. Um, And interestingly, you know, when they um, excommunicated me, it really was a very kind experience. Um, and I didn't f- realize, I didn't find this out till actually I came back to church. Um, when my blessings were restored, they, of course, had the transcript of my um, yeah. original church council. And the, my current state, then current state president, who I, who restored my blessings, said to me that the they were so torn over what to do with me because I was so sincere and truly loved the Lord. Um, and yet they felt like one, I needed to be released from my covenants. Right. Um, because I, I didn't want to leave my relationship with Richard, but also, um, they said very, um, prophetically that when I came back, I needed to have a clean start that I, I would, I would to, in order to feel like I had, truly been forgiven truly been forgiven yeah that i needed to be rebaptized more for me than for the lord and i found not that was very true when it happened yeah and and you uh, so you weren't at your disciplinary council when it happened you just i was oh you were there okay but when they but they were just reviewing the notes and things yes and, and the way you say that you know they felt it was important that you were you'd be released from your covenants and and that to me has such the spirit of, you know, the disciplinary councils I've been involved with as a leader of the really good ones. If, if it's done right, in my opinion, it never feels like this punishment. We're here to meet today to figure out how to punish this person for doing what they did, but it's all out of love. And, and, and reading that, and I don't know, I'm sure there's doctrine that is beyond my understanding, but um, of excommunicating somebody in order to release them from their covenants, not to excommunicate them, right? right? Almost like let's, let's remove the burden of these promises he's, he's made until he's ready to come back. And then we can start with from a, from a fresh slate. I mean, that's the grace of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Exactly. In a, that's the nutshell. atonement. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that's what was so powerful. And I, that 
beautiful memory of this bishop and stake presidency and the high council and the kindness that I felt. And frankly, their encouragement, right? Their encouragement to find my path and sort this out and God would be with me and God loved me made it easier when I came back because I never had any kind of disjointedness or um, kind of jarring or bitterness about the process. I truly felt loved throughout that process. That's awesome. Um, and and so where, where would you say as far as when it really got serious, so you two get met up and it was sort of together you made this decision of you know, why don't, why don't you be my teammate as we're both going back to church? Right. And this was before there was any necessarily sort of romantic feelings happening. Well, yes. before, well, yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> it was more of a brother sister relationship. It but. was, we, it is funny. My, you know, my, the day that my relationship ended in it, you know, and I was truly heartbroken and didn't want to tell my family family yet. Cause that's just, they would want to know too many details and I just wasn't, I wasn't ready to talk. And the only thing I really could do was send an instant message to Bennett. And I said, you know, you know, my partner and I just broke up and, um, and it was, it was really sad. And so, um, you know, I sent him a little note and hit send and popped up on a chat window, popped up on his computer and, and, um, and he typed, he instantly started typing back and I thought, wow, he's online. What are the chances? And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, it's funny because Richard and I just broke up too, like just now. Um, <laughs> and then he said, want to get married? And that's how it worked. Right? <laughs> and it was perfect. <laughs> well, and that's what started because Becky and I were very close. Like Becky knew things about me that you don't ever even tell your spouse, right? Yeah, we, were, yeah. we were that friend, right? <laughs> yes. And okay. so we had stayed very close as with the rest of our family for all this amount of time. And so, you know, as both of our very long term, very serious relationships and in mind, well, I was married, right? Yeah. So this was... Um, you know, I was going to have to going through a divorce and things like that, but it really caused, it gave us time to figure out, well, what do we want to do with our lives? And we had had a conversation. This was in the summer uh, when this all happened. And that prior Christmas, she and I had talked extensively for quite some time about having a family together, like, like her and her um, uh, partner, partner yeah. and Richard and I actually having a family together in some kind yeah. of modern family thing. And we were like, we're both getting older and, you know, we should, we've always wanted to have kids and we've never been able to. And so we should, the four of us should get together and have a family. And it, we, we talked for months <laughs> about how we would do this. I mean, we really talked often for months and in order to figure out whether this was the right thing and how would we want to raise them and would one of us move and would we live together and what kind of schools would we want to send them to? I mean, it was, it was a whole new kind of compound. It, we, it was a whole <laughs> new kind of compound, but we really wanted to talk through all the details because we took it very seriously. If we're going to bring kids into this world, what would their lives be like? And, you know, in that, in all of those discussions in 2011, you know, we really came to the conclusion that we'd want to raise them in the church. And, <laughs> That's we, interesting. You know, get, what, you know, right. <laughs> and, you know, because, but because both of us had had wonderful experiences being raised LDS yeah, and we were really not sure how we would pull that off. You know, we didn't figure we could drop them off at primary and be like, see in three hours, yeah. you know, and you know, were we going to go with them and how would that be? And, and I just, uh, we couldn't fathom it. Ultimately we decided it wasn't the right thing for us to have kids. We didn't think either one of our relationships were in a position where they could handle that. And, and lo and behold, six months later, they weren't. Um, but at the time we knew it probably wasn't the right thing for us to do, but it was through those discussions and considering our future children that we were willing to say out loud that the gospel was true. Yeah. And how we would put our lives together. Yeah. Like it was so interesting as we talked about, well, you know, we knew we were, we were really, really good friends, but also we talked about what our philosophy on life and finances and, you know, just, just how it, and so it was very clear that we would be like what we wanted out of our life, you know, that we would be compatible there. But what was more interesting is it put us in a, in a self-evaluative place. It did. Like, what do you want out of your life? And what's, you know, and, and we both had this sense of, um, dis-ease, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were, um, we weren't satisfied with our lives. And so it laid a lot of groundwork for now, six months later, when both of our relationships ended, I started thinking a lot about, well, now what? Right. So I was 40, what, two at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, again, I had this big successful partner, law no, firm. 45. And 45. Can't be. Come on. But something anyway. <laughs> so, but it really put me in this mindset of, of, 
I really wanted to come back to church. And I got to the point where, um, and that's really what my focus was on at first. And as Becky and I were talking through, kind of commiserating through the ends of our relationships, part of this was, well, what do we want out of our lives next? And we both started talking about coming back to church. And it was really a secondary idea. Well, if we come back, are we going to be all alone? Are we, and so that's where this idea of, of could we come back together? Not as together, together, but could yeah, we yeah. both simultaneously right. come back to church? Right. So that we had someone to talk to about it and someone to sit to and sit next to in church. Well, at least no, for now. I lived in, I lived oh, here and he was in D.C. Oh, so, you were so I was in Salt Lake apart, City huh? and he was in D.C. Gotcha. I had moved here with my ex in a cruel twist of fate um, <laughs> and was living here in, in Salt Lake with my partner. Um, so, yeah, we were we were long ways apart. So we really we just called each other every day. It was really a how are you doing today? Are you, you know, are you surviving? And what time of is it? How, how many vodkas have you had at noon? And, you know, cause it, <laughs> there was a lot of that, sure but you know, we were commiserating with each other, but keeping each other sane, I think during that part too, something that we could truly really talk to about the situation. Cause we both had the same background because we both believed that the Lord was in there somewhere and yeah. that we could find him. So it was, it was incredibly good for our friendship to go through that at the yeah. same time. Yeah. But that meant that when we, when we did talk about what, what would it look like if we came back and what are all of our fears about coming back and all those emails and phone conversations really helped to lay bare all of the things that were churning in our hearts and minds. And so it was more manageable when we could see it on, on paper, so to speak, or talk about it out loud. And we had talked about coming back. We didn't know how to do that yeah. or, or when to do that. We had a family reunion coming up in October of that year. I had a family reunion and Bennett was planning on coming anyway. Um, so we knew we would see each other at the beach in that, that October in 2012. And we decided that we would talk there and, and kind of see how we felt about the church and, and whether we really wanted to, to go on this journey together. But that's when we started talking about coming back together because we knew we like, like we knew we were friends. We, we loved each other deeply. And I remember one time, several drinks in on the phone with, <laughs> with Becky going, you know, what if there's something to this timing? Cause we had joked about, Oh, we should get married. You know? And yeah, but it was always a ha ha ha. Ew. Yeah. Right? right. Because he was like, you know, he's like my brother. He's yeah. like my best friend. And I thought that's, who would do that? And plus she was a girl, which was and, a big problem. Right. And he was a boy and that <laughs> boys are disgusting. So, yeah. <laughs> but it was, but there was, and we joke about this, but true, the, we were turning our lives over to God at this point because there were several things going on at once. One was, I don't, I gave up trying to figure out how I would come back and I just wanted to come back. Sure. Right. That I was starting to read the Book of Mormon and I got to, um, you know, Alma 32 where it talks about you know, to have faith uh, as, a, as a seed, right? The word of God is a seed. Even if have you have faith. a desire to, yeah. to believe. Yeah. And I remember getting down on my knees and saying, all right, I have no idea how I don't, but all I know is I have the desire to believe that I can come back and have a, a happy life in the gospel. Yeah. And really from that moment, things really started to change for me. And, you know, I remember calling Becky one time and saying, what if there's something to this timing? Like it's, isn't it interesting that we're both broken up at the same time. We're both considering coming back to church. We're both terrified that we're going to end up old, lonely spinsters for the rest of our life. <laughs> um, well, what if there's something to this? Like, yeah. isn't maybe we should do this together and we could have a life together. Right? Yeah. And, and I just want to underscore something you said, you know, we, because I was going to ask how, when you, when you sort of made the shift of like, okay, I'm, re I'm really going to do it now. I'm, I think I'm serious about going back to church how do you reconcile those thoughts and that motivation with, yeah, but I'm gay, you know, like that you start. The, so that second part, you start going, okay, no matter what. Right. Yeah. So if, and, and how you just sort of gave it up to the Lord and said, I don't know how this works. I don't know how the math works. I don't know how the emotions work, but I'm going back. And so I'm going to need your help. And that's sort of when it came, you, you really did turn it over to him. Right? Absolutely. Well, we decided that all the, if, if all, if we started thinking about the church in very, very basic terms, either it's true or it's not. And if it is, then everything about it is true. All the promises in the scriptures, all of it is true. So we decided, and Bennett said to me one day on the phone, okay, because we agreed to start reading the scriptures. And he said, okay, let's, let's read the scriptures un, under the assumption that it's all true. 
And I'd never done that before. I'd always wow. read them with a skeptic's eye, right? Or with a skeptical how did, how heart. Would Joseph Smith really right. and why how did this, he write right? that? So, I, <laughs> so it's, it really is truly different when you, when you come at it from a perspective of, I'm going to assume it's all true. Hmm. What great counsel a leader could give to somebody saying, okay, just as an exercise, as you read, just read from the standpoint of assuming, let, let's assume that it's true right. and read from that point of view. And so when we did that, then when you come upon all the promises in the scriptures about how the Lord's going to be there and he's going to help you. And if he has said that these things are important and you try to do those things and he will be there to help you achieve those things. I will go and, and thought, do the okay. things, right? Yeah, all yeah. right. Then it, then it really is an equation. If I do this, he will do this. And if I do this, he will do this. And, and I the, can expect it. I can expect it to the point where I don't have to wonder if he's going to do it. And the future became irrelevant, right? right? Like the mm. thing that we have learned is that the way that, that the adversary um, keeps you from progressing is we call it the what if hamster wheel, right? Mm. Like, well, what about this? Well, how am I going to do that? What's going to happen about this? You know, how are you going to do that? Well, who's, how are, you know, all those questions about the future. And there's a lot. And there <laughs> yes. are, especially the, he for can cre- the adversary can, can create them yeah. faster than they can get answered. Right. There's no, right. There's, and so finally it got to the point where I had enough faith in God that I simply said, I don't care. I don't care. I don't have to have those answers. All I need. So we had this whole thing and we have these wonderful journals we kept through this whole um, (laughs) process. And, you know, there was this, I was praying to God. I'm like, cause I, again, I was married. So I'm like, I've got to get out of my, how am I going to get divorced? How am I going to get, have my blessings back? How all all these things, right? (laughs) And the Lord kind of just said, shh. You know, and <laughs> I remember him saying to me in my mind, this um, is kind of like that, that scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants that says it will still upon your mind, like the dews of heaven or yeah, whatever that 121, is. 121, yeah. yeah. Doctor and we, so we, so we got the whole focus on your feet, right? Mm-hmm. That all I have to do today is take the step the size of a dewdrop, right? I don't have to worry. All, only thing I can control is what's going on right in front of me today. Right. And so get up, read your scriptures, say your prayers, feed yourself, put some clothes on, go to work <laughs> mm-hmm. and let all of the trouble of tomorrow fall away. And, and then it became doable. Yeah. This idea of coming back to church. And so when we were at the beach and that family reunion, and, that family reunion, and it's funny because when Bennett said to me on the phone that day, what if there's something more to this timing between you and I? And I, I think I laughed out loud at the time <laughs> probably sarcastically with my vodka in my hand um, <laughs> and my cigarette. Um, and I thought to myself, I, and it really wasn't me. It was the spirit. It was like a knife through the top of my head. And the spirit said, well, of course there's more to this timing. Of course there is. And I thought, Oh, <laughs> and I think I, I was in a, I was shell shocked for the next several days considering that I just gotten direct revelation to my life that yes, there was something more to this. And not only that, and I love how the, how the Lord communicates with you through the spirit that it's a fully formed thought, right? It's not even a linear sentence. It's yeah. just a fully formed thing that sometimes plops down in your mind. So it wasn't only, of course, there's more to this, but whatever it is that you need to do to get yourself ready so that you can be with this person for eternity is what you must do with great haste without looking back. You must do this immediately. And I was shell-shocked, truly. So we got to the beach. <laughs> and we saw each other for the first time um, when he he got there after we did. And, and we knew the moment that we saw each other, yeah. the absolute moment that this was all there was. And so it was love at the millionth sight. Yeah. Right. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> and terrifying, right? Yeah. Because now we're to the point of, okay, well, going getting over all the fears and anxiety about coming back to church, because then, you know, we have to wear the right clothes. We have to show up. People are going to talk about us, right? All the fears and everything you have, because for some reason, the idea of going to church when you're kind of on the outside is like the scariest thing you've ever done in your life. You do you think you're going to be 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide and everybody's so going to see you and you have a giant pink queer triangle thing on yeah. your forehead yeah. and neon and yeah. Uh. And so despite all that and, you know, personally getting my life in order to come back to church. But now there is this added layer of this wonderful excitement of being with my best friend and yet all the terror of being in a marriage and a heterosexual relationship and all those things. So that we had these storms of anxiety and terror about how would this possibly work out? But in the midst of all of it, there is this utter peace. Truly. And, you know, we decided we were at the beach together for three days and stayed up all night, every night talking like for, you know, eight or nine hours about what we would do and how, and all our fears and anxieties and how we would move through those. And, but we decided the one thing we did is 
we got a hold of my brother, Bob, and he gave us, he looked up and found the bishop's phone numbers and email addresses for both of our bishops in Salt Lake for her and in DC for me. Because we had no idea who they were. Yeah, how do you find we that? Had no idea. <laughs> like, how would we know um, that? <laughs> and so we made the commitment while we were there that we would reach out for a first appointment. And we did. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting, and we'll tell you those stories, but it was being able to be together for those few days and feel the witness of the spirit and also that peace, despite the raging storm of unknown Mm -hmm. that taking that step of calling our bishops was a monumental step. So where did it go from there? You both, did you both go together? No, no, because I I, went back home. I came back out here to to Salt Lake and then it went home to DC. So we both had called our bishops that last day, made appointments (laughs) and because we committed that we would, and then we actually had to keep the appointments, which was much far worse than them <laughs> calling to make the appointment. So much worse. And so uh, the first time I went, um, I was in the Capitol Hill First Ward. I was living um, up on on Second North, and uh, my bishop, Bishop Garbett, bless his heart, I came in. It was like a Tuesday night, and I'd had I was petrified of going in, and I had a lot to drink. And to, so to ease your nerves, to ease my nerves. Yes. And so I was very drunk by the time I got in his office, bless his heart. But, you know, he listened to me say everything I had to say. And the first thing out of his mouth was welcome back. And we love you so much. And I'm so glad you're here and it's going to be okay. And he didn't have anything to tell me to do. He just said, well, let's talk again. Can you come back next week? Do you think you want to come on Sunday? Because I, you know, I'd love to tell the Relief Society president about you and make sure that you have somebody to sit next to. And, you know, he's a very soft-spoken, very kind man. And so he's very shy. He didn't have a whole lot to say, but he wanted to hear whatever it was I had to say. And he said, you know, would I I asked him for a priesthood blessing, which he gave me. And he said, you know, I'd love to send my counselors over to dedicate your house if you'd like that. And, And which was perfect. And so they came over like the next day to dedicate my house and my tiny little apartment that I was living in and and introduced me to my next door neighbor who was the former state president. And so they had me over to dinner and, and the moment I walked in on Sunday morning to relief society, which is the first time I'd ever been to relief society. I'd never been as a kid because I left before I was old enough. And the, the relief study president, Jane Lyman, and she says, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to see you. And she put her arm around me and gave me a big hug and said, come sit right here. This is where I'm sitting. And, I could not have been more accepted and loved and welcomed and it didn't matter to them what my circumstances were. And that was the biggest deal. It didn't matter that I was wearing pants. None of it mattered. It's just the fact that I was there. And I did. I went every week to talk to Bishop Garbett mm-hmm. and called Bennett right afterward. I mean, we, <laughs> we talked about all these appointments and, you know, his his situation was equally, I think, is wonderful. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I appreciate these little things you mentioned where, you know, Bishop Garbett, it's not that you came in and he said the, just the perfect thing. Because we get in this trap as leaders that our role is to say the perfect thing, to share the perfect scripture and the pressure's on us. But it's so easy to just sit and listen in that office and and then say something as simple as welcome back. You know, what, what what's the next step for you? What would you feel comfortable with? You know, and great story. So, so Ben, what was... Yeah, mine was very similar. So, you know, I was living right outside of D.C. in Arlington and called my bishop and went in again on a Tuesday. I think I was and met with him. And again, this is a long story, right? You know, here is, I'm a married gay guy and explaining my whole life and wanting to come back. And, and he was, he looked like he was about 17. Um, <laughs> uh, he was 31. Yeah, he was, but he, he looks like, uh, what's Bishop. even better than that. He had been called as Bishop two weeks before this. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he, he was, was fully prepared. prepared. He was yes, fully, fully prepared. prepared. <laughs> um, but could not have been kinder. Even when I'm talking to him, like I'm telling this, you know, long sorted tale. And he was um, very kind, even as he listened to me. And, and similarly, he said to me, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome back. And he said, I don't know. You know there's lots of steps here, but let's just go through them together. Yeah. You know, the next day, two home teachers came to my house who are still very dear friends of ours. We had lots of opportunities to, again, Bishop Talbot didn't say anything terribly profound, except I love you and welcome back. And we're so glad you're here. And let's just take this step by step. Let's just figure this out together. Let's see what comes next. Can you come to church on Sunday? And Bishop Talbot was just brilliant because he, my whole life was changing. Like I was getting divorced you know, Richard and I were a very well-known couple in DC. I was, you know, having to change my whole life. So everything was in an uproar and having 
fairly often contact with the church. I couldn't hold a calling, couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so he put me on like the building cleanup committee, you know, all of them. We like, I, like one of the early things Becky and I did After was. I moved to DC. I moved to DC a few months later. Yeah. And he put us in charge of like inventorying the library, you know, like <laughs> st- the stuff that we, but it was great fun. Luckily, we met, you had a law degree. You could <laughs> I know. Well, we, and we asked, you know, what can we do? How can we be involved? Cause we can't hold callings. We can't say prayers. We can't do anything. Right. Yeah. Because we're not going to be baptized for months and months and months. And it was wonderful to be able to be of service and bless his heart. He sent the missionaries. We had several <laughs> sets in our ward of missionaries. There were missionaries in our house like every other day. I think <laughs> he called them all and said, stop at the board. Yeah, stop at right. the board today. You should stop at the board yeah. today. And they did all the time. And it was great because we would put our wine away. You know, it was, it was wonderful because they brought the spirit into our home. Yeah. That was the thing. The whole key to this all was, you know, Becky and I, as we were starting to come back, because she still lived in Salt Lake, at least for the first many months, it was so important to keep the spirit because the raging... Yeah, what if, was raging. How can you do this? This yeah. is stupid. How are you ever going to be yes. happy? You're going to be miserable the rest of your life. How are you going to go through this? It was scary how angry the adversary was. He was after us so hard. I remember days of just abject fear and yeah. vibrating. I was so scared. Because he was churning up in me all the awful stuff that he could possibly come up with. Yeah. It was hard. It yeah. was hard work. And so being able to focus down and focus on your feet, that became our mantra. Focus mm-hmm. on your feet. Just take one more step and make one more choice. But I think our bishops and state and, and our state president in D.C. Um, yeah. was just, they were remarkable in their kindness and love and openness and not judgmental and not asking too many prying questions. They were just happy for us to share whatever it was we needed to share at that point. And when we asked about next steps, they were like, I don't know, let's figure that out. And it became something that we did with them as opposed to yeah. a, a process we were a victim of. Yeah. And, and so this time you're, you're both, you're now living. I've, I've moved to DC, moved to DC a few so. weeks before we got married in oh, 2013. Okay. Yeah. So marriage was on the schedule. And, oh yeah. And, We'd, uh, we, as soon as his divorce to Richard was final, we got engaged and that was in February of 2013 and we were married on June 1st of 2013. So I am in a civil wedding in, at, at the, uh, at the ward building. At the ward building. Yeah. yeah. Our, our Bishop married us oh, at the ward building in DC and, or in Arlington. So yeah, we, I had moved out there in May. So uh, what I'm hearing is, you know, obviously that your Bishop as well was opening, open, welcoming you back, you know, trying to figure it out with you. And, and that's such a, a vulnerable spot to be as a leader, but a, a good spot of just saying like, you know what? I just got put in this, this calling two weeks ago. I don't know. So let's learn together, you know, and that's okay. And it invites yeah. the spirit in. Yeah, the does. spirit does Doesn't the it? leading. Yeah. And then really the ward making an effort to find a place for you to serve. Right? Tremendously and really caring leaders all around. So the, yeah. you know, the, I attended a high priest, which isn't it? Cause I was an elder. Yeah. That was a big deal. So yeah. Bennett said, you know, I, I, it would be really hard for me to attend the elders quorum because these are young, handsome men. And who were 20 be, years younger it, than me too, right? Yeah. You know, it's not like we had a lot in common. Right. right. But, and, but the fact that they were also, so, you know, it, and when, for somebody coming back, it may be hard, Yeah. you know, so it was easier for him to say, you know, and so the bishop said, well, why don't you attend high priest? And that was so much easier on Bennett during that transition period. Yeah. So much easier. That's great. So there's an interesting uh, twist. I don't want to call it a twist, but a, a happy a story that, that parallels yours that involves, involves Richard. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. And this was because, you know, I loved and love Richard very much. And and he, Becky knows him, had been known him my whole marriage. And he was very close to us. And, you know, so when our marriage fell apart, one, I, I tried very hard to leave that relationship with kindness and love and charity. Because, you know, often those things are not that way. Right. Um, and yet we had spent 20 years together, had spent so much healing and love um, with each other. And so when the, that relationship ended, it was really important to me that it did so in a kind way. And he knew really fairly immediately that I was going back to church, was very supportive because he was close to my family, right? He was, you know, all my Mormon brothers and their wives and kids and my parents. And right. So he had been ra- around the church for years. And so he was very supportive of me going back to church. And it's interesting when Becky and I got married, we started having family reunion together. And Richard would come over often and he came over one Monday and we're like, oh, we're starting a family reunion. And so I just started in. (laughs) 
and he happened to come over, I think, the next Monday. And so I was teaching the first lesson and Becky was teaching the second. And Becky turns was to him. the plan of salvation. And I'd done it. I knew he was coming. So I'd done it on giant post-it notes, uh-huh. and like drawing the whole thing out. And he's like, oh, can I take that home? I mean, he'd never seen anything like it. And yeah. he's like, that's fantastic. I need, I need to take that home and put it on my door so I can look at it and understand it. And I said, well, great, because next Monday it's your turn. Because <laughs> Bennett did the first one and now I've yeah. done the second one. So now it's your turn. He's like, what do I do? And I said, well, flip to the back of the scriptures, pick a topic, look up all the scriptures you can find on it, think about it, pray about it, and tell us what you feel. Uh-huh. He's like, I can do that. So he did. He did. He did. <laughs> Went home, did the whole thing, came back next Monday, taught us a lesson on the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Or humility. Or I don't know. It was yeah. something wonderful. It was just wonderful experience and it, it's so interestingly because we we were in dc only for about a year and when we moved out here to salt lake richard kept an interest to the church um, actually took the missionary lessons and was baptized a couple of years ago now and then just last year um i had the great blessing of actually being able to go and ordain richard as an elder yeah that's that's incredible yeah i love that story and and you know and there's so many just these tender mercies throughout yeah your experience and, and at the same time, recognizing the, the, the tactics of the adversary and the fear and the, the what ifs that he's, he's putting in your mind. But, um, and to see, you know, as other lives are blessed as well, like Richard's and, and see him. And that's what's, what's so, so important, important to keep in mind, Kurt, is that looking at the end now, looking at mine and Becky's and even Richard's life now, where we are, you know, Becky and I um, are endowed and have an eternal marriage and, and Richard is a priesthood holder and, and, it took 25 years of right. <laughs> wrangling and wandering to get us to be able to be at this place. Right. And, you know, we look back and see all the twists and turns of our lives that made it possible for us to be happy and healthy in the gospel. And I but couldn't. If we hadn't had though that circuitous path, we wouldn't be where right. we are now. And so many family and friends and leaders forget that part. Yeah. That sometimes when you're talking to that 22 or 24 or 26 year old kid, you know, and they're like, oh, but you can do this, the board. And, you know, I know people that have done this. Well, sure. But their experience was yeah. different. And sometimes you have to go through the journey in order to arrive at the destination. Yeah. You know, and I don't it's not that you're saying we found a model that yeah, works. Not at all. So here, here's the model. Go to give <laughs> no. this to your, your yeah. wayward son or daughter not and it'll work. Right. All. But you're just recognizing the value of your journey, the progress happening outside of the gospel, quote unquote, you know, and during, during your keynote at North Star, Bennett, you mentioned something about, I don't know if it was a parent that asked you, but you know, a parent of a, of a gay child is saying, how do I pray for my, my son or daughter who is, you know, living a gay lifestyle? Because do I pray that they're happy? Do I pray that they come back? Uh, and what do I pray for? Yeah. Expound yeah. on that. And you know, this is where one of the things that have been so joyous for Becky and I is being able to get to know people who have same sex attraction, their families, their leaders, their friends, and being able to just talk about what is so important to us, what changed our lives. And one of this, we, we met a mom um, whose son was in his late teens and, and coming out. And she was, she literally just heartbreakingly asked us, what do I pray for? And, you know, we said, well, you pray that you can have an influence on him, that he will have the experiences that he needs for his salvation, just like anybody else. Yeah. Whatever you pray for, for your other children. Right. Same, same. And then be there, right? right? The thing right. that has the most influence, like I look back on my family, some of whom were very accepting and some of whom were simply weren't. Yeah. And the ones who were not just had no influence in my life at all. Yeah. Hmm. And yet my brother, Bob, who I'm, who I love very dearly had us, had me and Richard at their house all the time for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we were there, we were close to them like family should be. Yeah. They cared about my life and Richard's life and what we were doing. And it was that that allowed them to influence us. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the same with Becky's family. Yeah, I would say that. And I think some of the things that my mom probably prayed for over the years, not just that I would have the experiences that I needed for my salvation, wherever I was in my life, but also that she would know what to say, that she would know how to bring the spirit, that she would know when and what to offer to me. And praying for that guidance as parents and friends and leaders pray for that guidance to recognize those opportunities when they come, but that they are also praying that they can have the spirit with them all the time because it was the spirit with my mother that made an influence on me yeah. and with my sisters. And you know, the, the times that I spent in their homes where the spirit was present 
that was the most important part is that they were praying for the insight and understanding and influence of the spirit in their lives. Yeah. And when we say touched by the spirit, we don't mean that we sat down to family meeting with these people. Right. 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 Like, like one of my brothers um, who I truly love and who is my, my most Mormon of all brothers. <laughs> we all got one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and truly loved me, but really felt like he had to tell me that my life wasn't going, wasn't right. Like he yeah. couldn't condone it, certainly. So therefore he wouldn't do anything with me. I wasn't invited to his home because he didn't want to condone my lifestyle. But then he never failed to take the opportunity to tell me that wickedness never was happiness. And, you know, finally I blew up at him one time and I'm like, that does no good. What possible good does that do me? It's like telling a drowning person, don't drown. Drowning's not good for you. You shouldn't breathe that water. That's yeah. not good for you. It's useless. It yeah. doesn't do anything. Hop in the water. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Go to where you are. Right. right. And it is. And that's what it is. It's go to where you are. My sister and my mother invited me over. They never said, but don't bring your partner or don't bring any wine into this house or no, you, you know, I know you're coming from Christmas for Christmas with your partner, but you guys can't share a room or you can't, you know, be affectionate in front of the kids or we don't want to have to explain that. They're, they never said any of those things. Yeah. You know, when I had wine in the house and the kids are like, well, what's that? Oh, that's wine. Well, we don't drink wine. That's right. We don't. But we love Becky. But we love Aunt Becky. We're glad yeah. she's here. You know, th there was, there was no discussion around it because that's okay. Yeah. They honored my agency. This is something Allie Isom said in her keynote at North Star. She talked about honoring her child's agency. And when her child was, you know, dying from a, a very significant genetic disease, I think, or something like that. But anyway, it is, that is the thing that I have learned most in this is that through our journeys, the people that honored our agency and loved us at the same time, those are the people right. that had access and influence on us. And ultimately, that was a source or influence of our conversion, yes. right? Is because, like I said, after I tried everything, success, good partner, you know, all these things, to, I still wasn't happy. But I would walk into their homes where they were doing like one of the best experiences I ever had <laughs> was we went to Becky's sister's house and they had just, they had little kids and they had just finished reading the Book of Mormon for the first time. It took them like three years. And they had a Book of Mormon party <laughs> uh -huh. where you wrapped a towel around your you head. You dressed up as your favorite character. And you dressed up like your favorite character. <laughs> and, and you told their story. And it was one of the most poignant, beautiful things to see this little family and the love they shared, the spirit that was in their home. And then I walked out of that room and went back to my my opulent Mercedes Armani suits life that was dark and dank and empty. They never said a word to me. I never tried to teach me anything. It was just simply being around them. And it's not that they plan like, okay, let's have our book of Mormon no, party right, right before Bennett right. comes, you know? Right. It was just, they just lived their life and, and you. They were like, yeah, come on over. Spirit. We're having a book of Mormon party. So if you yeah. want to be here, we're like, <laughs> sure, great. whatever. That's great. <laughs> well, uh, just to, to close it up here, I have a few, uh, maybe one more question, but, what would you say? I know you're more and more involved with North Star. Maybe what's the ask there that uh, what, what do we need to know about North Star? I've talked about a lot on our the podcast before, but uh, what's your involvement there and how could a leaders leverage it and use it to, to understand these situations better? So we've been really touched by we didn't really know North Star um, when we were out in D.C. like we had when we first came back to the church and, and Becky and I spoke at a conference that was being held out in, in, in D.C. and we we were then introduced some people at North Star and it's really a beautiful organization that is the whole purpose of the organization is to help people who experience same-sex attraction, the LB LGBT community who are Mormon, try to keep their covenants. Their whole mission is to help you develop a relationship with God and with your community, your family, and your leaders. And so it's a wonderful resource uh, at NorthstarLDS.org that has wonderful resources for those of us in the community, but also our our leaders and families. And it's been... As we've gotten to know them, we have been so touched by the work that they do. And even in our own lives, the point where we've now gotten kind of officially involved. Um, and so Becky and I, just in the last few weeks here, have uh, gotten involved with the board and the executive committee of North Star. That's great. Well, and just in, in closing, kind of the last question I have is, what would you say to those out there that maybe they're, they're a few years back in, in the process you were, where they're, they're feeling this need, this emptiness. They want to come back. There's a lot of what ifs and, you know, maybe a, a, they're going to a leader and he doesn't know what to say to him. What, what would be your message to those individuals that whether it's, you know, experiencing same sex attraction or not, that are just paralyzed by the what ifs and the adversary coming at them. Becky, why don't you? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was reading recently 
that one of the, and I think Elder Holland said, one of the most disobeyed commandments of the Lord is fear not and worry not. And we spend so much of our lives fearing and worrying about anything and everything. But the Lord has said over and over and over, fear not and worry not. And that is one of the things that I think we have truly learned in this journey is that the Lord is truly on our side. And all the things that he has said that are, that are important for us to do and important for us to pay attention to, he will be there to help us achieve those things, the speed of which will be perfectly suited to what we need. And the biggest thing that we learned and the biggest thing that I would say is focus on your feet. Yeah. Do what is in front of you. The rest of it doesn't matter yet. Those choices are not before you yet. So all the things that you may be worrying about or maybe fearing that will come or not come to you in the future, you have no idea what the Lord's going to pull off. We had no idea yeah. what the Lord was going to pull off. If you had told us this four years ago, we would have laughed, yeah. laughed at you, right? Or five years ago. So it, you have no idea what's going to happen. And you, assuming that you do know what's going to happen and that you're going to predict what the Lord's going to be able to do or not do for you, it isn't wise. Ye are as little children and cannot understand all things. And that's really, we, you know, when it got to the point where, especially in my own personal journey, where I stopped trying to predict the future and worry about it. Because, you know, so many of our gay friends in the church, people who are trying to come back, they think, look, I've got two options here. I can act on my feelings and be in a gay relationship and feel like I've got some emotional connection and be out of the church. Or I can keep my covenant, stay in the church and be lonely and um, and die of a horrible lonely death right basically <laughs> and that yeah <laughs> everybody thinks those are your two options yeah and that's just not true it's like white knuckling it <laughs> it's not one you have no idea what the lord can do you have no idea what the lord can do and you know like becky said the thought of me being in a heterosexual relationship that is beautiful fulfilling in every way was impossible i never in a million years thought that i would ever be in that or even want that and yet, once we focused on our feet and turned the future over to the Lord and didn't disbelieve what the Lord could do, right. right, then it's when the love started to blossom between us and the relationship developed between us to where now we have this beautiful, wonderful, eternal marriage. And so focusing on your feet and believing that the Lord can do anything, that is where it really changed the world for us. That concludes this episode of the Leading Saints podcast. We'd love to hear from you about your questions or thoughts or comments. You can either leave a comment on the uh, post related to this episode at leadingsaints.org or go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and send us your perspective or questions. If there's other episodes or topics you'd like to hear on the Leading Saints podcast, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and share with us the information there. And we would love for you to share this with any individual you think this would apply to, especially maybe individuals in your ward council or other leaders that you may know who would really appreciate the perspectives that we discussed. And that concludes this throwback episode of the Leading Saints podcast. And remember, text the word LEAD to 474747 in order to access the three free sessions of the LGBT Saints Library. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.